Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. All right, this is a third theory lecture of uh, Module 5, Deep Computer Vision. In part one, we cover deep computer vision basics. We talked about human vision versus computer vision. We also discussed why fully connected networks are not enough when it comes to computer vision. Then we talked about what is a convolution and we co covered some of the basic definitions like what is a filter, what is size, stride, and padding, and etc. In part two, we covered the very basic CNN architecture and we said that each convolutional neural networks consists of an input layer, convolutional layers followed up by a bunch of pooling layers, and then finally the, by a fully connected layer. Then we also talked about some of the important concepts when it comes to convolutional operations, like what is a point-wise convolution, what is a depth-wise convolution. We covered depth-wise separable convolution, and we concluded the, core, uh, the this section by talking about transpose convolutions. In this part, part three, we're going to talk about more advanced architectures. Basically, we're going to discuss the idea of what are the steps, what are the best practices to put together a decent architecture. Then we're going to talk about interpretable CNN. And finally, we're going to wrap up this section by talking an important concept called transfer learning. Now, without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, confident architecture best practices. So here is a very simple CNN architecture. In the past two lecture videos and the Python part, we talked about how we can put together a very simple CNN architecture like this, right? So imagine the question on hand is a handwritten digit classification, right? So we have an image like this, number two, 28 by 28 by one, because it's grayscale, and the output is 10 class classification, right? But basically numbers between zero to nine. So we're gonna use a softmax activation function at the very end layer, right? But how can we decide how many convolution layers do we need? How can we decide the why, why we need to have max pooling after that? How do we decide on the filter size so or the type of the, the type of the padding uh, type of the padding? How do we decide how many filters should we use? These are all very important questions, right? And for example, in this very basic um, architecture, what do we have? We have a conf layer followed by a max pooling, another conf layer followed by a max pooling. We're flattening things, and then we're going to use another fully connected layers at the very end, right? And for example, at the very end, we're adding dropout as well. So there are so many moving parts in this architecture that we need to make a decision, right? So here we say the filter size is five by five. So that's why, and we are using the padding type valid. Valid, as we talked about it before, it, it simply means that uses use the valid windows in a grid pixel, right? So if we do that, we go from a size 28 by 28 by 1 to, 20, to 24, 24, and by N1. And this N1 is the number of channels, number of filters that you're using in the first conf layer, right? Then we did the max pooling, and the max pooling size 2 by 2. So basically, the size was cut in half. 12 by 12 by N1. On top of that, we did another conv layer, right? So uh, using the same filter size, 5 by 5, we go from 12, 12 to 8 by 8. And as you can see, it seems that there is a pattern. As we go deeper down in the network, uh, the dimension is decreasing, but the number of filters that you're using is increasing. So it means that those filters, by the way, with the same size of 5 by 5, are attending to more parts, to more global aspect of your input image, right? Uh, or the output of each convolutional layer. So these are really important observations and questions that we need to, uh, we need to discuss, right? And as you can see, it seems more like an art rather than science, right? So the question is, is there a, is there a recipe for that? Is there a guideline? What are the best practices? So let's look into the, the, to these important questions. Let's start with the MHR formula. So modularity, hierarchy, and reuse. It seems that there is this universal recipe, if you wish, for making a complex system simpler, right? So think of a complex system just like human body, right? This is what we are all familiar with. And let's let's try to understand this complex system, right? This is one of the most complex systems ever, right? So we're going to structure this model into different modules. This is the modularity part, right? We're going to break it down into different modules. So for example, we can, you know, you can say different, you know, we have four limb and then maybe 10 fingers, 10 toes, and then what's going on in the brain itself, it can be decomposed to, I don't know, eyes, ears, etc. right? So this is the modularity part, right? 
then in the next step we are going to organize these modules into hierarchy and again within each module we can think of a hierarchy we can put together a module in a hierarchy as well so for example in in a previous lecture video we talked about what's going on in in human brain when it's uh, perceiving an image right we talked about the visual cortex so we talked about this v1 v2 v3 layers we said that the v1 is responsible for handling the low uh, low level features like edges lines v2 more texture v3 you know more abstract concepts and etc right as you can see there is this hierarchical ordering happening within module uh, modules as well right and then we're going to start reusing the same modules in different multiple places as we see appropriate right so for example here we're talking about you know fingers so we have 10 of them so there's same module applied 10 times you know 10 toes same module applied 10 times right so this way we can start understanding the complexity of these systems we can start simplifying them right now and this is exactly the pattern that we observe in most successful deep learning architectures out there, right? Now we have a recipe, right? We know that whatever that complex system, whatever that architecture that you want to put together is, it should be, you know, something come as modulars in hierarchical order, and we should be able to reuse that modules over and over again. Now the question is that, are there any best practices that can help us to get a better performance of that architecture? And the answer is yes, right? So here's a list of three of them. The first one is residual connections, and the, all of them are going to help us, all these best practices are going to help us to get a better, better performance uh, out of this system, right? So the first one, residual connection. The second one, batch normalization. And the third one, separable convolutions. So these are some techniques that we can improve the performance of our CNN architecture, CNN model, by applying these best practices, right? And some of them are more explainable than the other ones. You know, some of them, there is, they're more scientific. So, for example, for residual connections, we know the science behind it. For separable convolution, it's very simple to understand. But when it comes to batch normalization, even though there is a paper uh, written on that, but it seems that nobody clearly knows that what's happening with batch normalization, but, but the point is that it works, right? And as long as it works, we're going to apply it. All right, let's start with the first one, residual connections. Well, the, have you ever heard about a game of telephone or China's whisper? When there is first person whispering some word, like for example here, peas, to the ear of the second person, and they're supposed to whisper it to the ear of the next person, right? So let's say peas. And as you can see, at each point, it seems that there is some noise added to that, right? And at the end of the day, the, the, the thing that the last person is hearing can be far from uh, the reality, right? So, for example, this guy is hearing fleas or he's wondering if it is fleas or not, but the original word was peace, right? So the idea is that when the network is too deep, so in this example, uh, this, you know, we have multiple people, right? Then successive, successive functions in the chain introduce some noise, right? So this is inevitable. When we have, when we are going to, you know, design a very deep neural network, so it is inevitable that at some point, it, the noise is gonna make some trouble, right? And that, that, that trouble is that during training, when we are doing backpropagation, this noise starts overwhelming the gradient information, right? And what's going to do, it's going to, of course, make impact on the weights, right? So what is the solution? The solution is very simple. We're going to add this input of a layer or blocks of layers back to its output. So here's a schematic version of that, so which can help. So the idea is that you have an input, you can call it X, then we have a layer or blocks of layer, it can be a, a block of you no know, conf, conf pooling, conf pooling, conf pooling, and etc. And then we are going to add these things together and pass it to the next block of layers, right? So F of X plus X, we're going to pass this one to the next block. This is called residual connect connection. You know, you can think of it as, you know, information shortcut, right? This is a shortcut around that noisy, that troublesome block, right? And we're going to look at the, the architecture of ResNet in the uh, lecture slides in this video. But uh, just remember, this ResNet family of models was introduced back in 20, 2015 by He et al. Uh, at Microsoft. Okay. 
Okay, second method, batch normalization. I think we're all familiar with the concept of normalization. We know that it's a statistical method to just make sure that our data set, the input uh, is in the same scale, right? You wanna make sure that different samples are seen more similar to each other by your machine learning or deep learning model, right? And we also know that the normalization in general is gonna help the model to learn and generalize better in the new data. But the point is that when we do normalization, we do it at the very first step. You know, we have an input, we normalize it, and then we're done with it, right? So we say that, okay, let's let's not touch the data anymore and let's pass it through different layers in the network and look at the output, right? But the idea is that why? Why we should stop there? What if we wanna normalize the activation, the intermediate activations, right? What if I wanna normalize, or not what if, the question is that, is it going to help that if we normalize the output of each conf layer, for example, right? And uh, so that's the idea of batch normalization, right? So the batch normalization is gonna normalize the mean and standard deviation for each individual channel or feature map, or in general, you can think of it as any intermediate activation after any kind of transformation, right? And we're gonna do this normalization using the current batch of data. So this is where the name is coming from. And let's look at this visualization. It's gonna help a ton understanding it. So imagine here we have channels. Again, you can think of channels of filters or intermediate activations, right? These are the convolent outputs or feature map. And then we have height and width. This is our spatial dimension for image. And here we have, you know, these are samples in a batch, right? So the way that the batch normalization is basically working is that we're looking at a batch of data for each channel, for each filter, for each intermediate activations, you, you, whatever you name it, right? And that's the name batch normalization is coming from. There are different ways of normalizing, so we can think of you no know, layer normalization or again, group normalization. These are the topics that I'm gonna talk about then when it, when it gets to the transformer section of the course. But in general, just like ResNet, batch normalization, so this is an important one, just like the ResNet, batch normalization helps with gradient propagation, right? It helps the information to flow more smoothly than when you're doing uh, forward or backward propagation. This allows for deeper networks, okay? So again, both batch normalization and ResNet will help us to handle that uh, gradient propagation and allow us to have deeper networks. The last one is separable convolutions. So as we talked about it in the previous part of the uh, lectures, depth-wise separable convolutional layers are going to perform some comp operations at two steps. The first step is to basically performing spatial convolution on each channel of the input, right? So let me show you. So this is the first step. So we have an input. We're going to look at the channel separately. Again, deeper in the, remember guys, deeper in the network, these channels, we are going to call them filters, right? So we're going to treat them independently and apply conv operations. So this is where we're splitting a channel or a filter. And then um, let's say here we have one, two, three, four channels or filters, right? So we're gonna apply independently convolutional operation to them. Then we're gonna concatenate them. And in the second step, we're gonna use pointwise convolutional layers to just to change the shape of the channel, right? So, and usually we do this when there are some reasons, you know, but, this, uh, but at a very high level, if you think that uh, there is more than spatial relationship in the data, right? Because we know that convolutional operation is gonna preserve that spatial relationship. But if you think that there are some nuances within each channel, within each filter that you should control for. So this is where the depth-wise separable convolutional uh, operations is gonna help, right? And uh, usually we're gonna apply to filters later in the, you know, well, deeper in the network, and or the input or, or the channels are fundamentally different. So for example, if you have an RGB channel, you know, the color channel, they're they are highly correlated. So, so maybe there's not much within each channel to be, to be discovered compared to you know, basically looking at the spatial uh, the relationship, right? So then we're gonna say separable convolutions will do these three things for us. It's gonna make the model smaller because there are a lot fewer trainable parameters. You know, these parameters are weight parameters, right? 
And also, we also saw that a numerical example in the previous video, the, we said that it requires a lot fewer multiplications operations. So basically we say that it requires fewer float point operations, right? So we saw this before. And then finally, we know that this is gonna improve the performance of the model. So because of all these properties, we are gonna use separable convolutions as well. At least we can, we can go ahead and give it a try to see if we can get a better performance overall or not. For the speed-wise, however, you should be cautious, even though it seems that we're working with a lot less parameters and a lot less operations, but because of some technical reasons that you can uh, look at the details in the book of uh, 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 Francois Cholet, you know, his, his book, you know, Deep Learning with Python, he explained it in details that why, but the idea is that in terms of speed, you, you will not save much compared to simple convolutional layers. Okay, so that's it. These are the three methods for uh, basically best practices to improve the performance of the CNN model. So now let's put it together. So let's summarize what we discussed so far. If you want to come up with your own architecture that most probably, hopefully, it's going to work. So these are the best practices that you should be aware of. First of all, your model should be organized into repeated blocks of layers. So this is the MHR formula we talked about, right? Usually those layers are made of multiple convolutional layers followed up by max pooling. So this is your first thing you should remember. The second thing, the number of filters in your layers should increase as the size of the spatial feature map decrease. So this is, we have, we have talked about it multiple times, uh, multiple times now, but the idea is that let's say you start from a, I don't know, 38 by 38 image. And let's say it's grayscale or, 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 or color, it really doesn't matter. The idea is that as we go deeper in the network, this dimension is going to shrink, right? So for example, if we go to 28, 28, then 14 by 14, and maybe we can shrink it down to up something 5 by 5, right? And because the dimension of the input image is decreasing, uh, then we have the luxury of basically expanding the filter size, right? So we can say that, let's say here, I'm gonna use, I don't know, 32 filters, here I'm gonna use 64 filters, here I'm gonna use, at the very end, I'm gonna use 256 filters, right? So 64, 32. So the idea is that, again, computationally, because we're reducing the size, we have the luxury, you know, we, we can afford adding more filters. And, add it, and remember, those filters have the same size. So for example, 32 filters, let's say it's three by three. These 256 filters is three by three, right? They can attend to a more broader uh, pixels of the, let's say, feature map, right? And uh, yeah, so this is, again, these are, as I said earlier, guys, this is, uh, this is not science. This is more of an art, but we know that these best practices work, right? And for example, some of the more successful models like VGG16 that we're gonna look at the structure, it, it is following this exact same patterns, right? Or, or many other more advanced state-of-the-art models. If you break them down, you'll see that at the end of it, it's basically putting together these steps and then applying them to a, uh, to a decent network. The third one is, um, the deep and narrow is better than broad and shallow. So again, the deeper the network, and narrower the network is going to be better than to basically a shallow network with so many neurons or so many conv, uh, uh, so many uh, at, at each conv layer you just want to expand it. Don't don't do it that way, right? So if you want to go with a deep and narrow network, you have to apply these methods that you just covered, right? Basically using residual residual connections to help train deeper networks. Use batch normalization to get a better performance. And finally, you can go ahead and tr at least give, uh, try it out, right? You know, replace these conf 2 d operations to separable conf 2 d operations. These are these are the layers, right? And uh, hopefully, we know that these separable conf 2 d layers are more parameter efficient. They are not faster necessarily because of, again because of some technical things, but they are more parameter efficient. All right. Okay, now we know what is a model architecture. What are the best practices? Basically, now we have a recipe. Let's look. Let's talk about interpreting conv nets as well, right? So, because uh, in general we think that deep learning is black box, and it's not a wrong statement. But the idea is that when it comes to computer vision, it is probably the most interpretable kind of deep learning application that you can think of, right? So computer visions they are actually very well um, interpretable. Let's look into those concepts.
A cool thing about computer vision is that you can literally visualize what these confidence are learning. So this is what makes it a lot more interpretable compared to other deep learning models, right? So for example, we can visualize the confident output of these, you know, let's say layers in the middle of the network, right? So these are intermediate layers. And uh, how it's going to look like? So for example, this is, we have an input, right? Let's say this is the input. And then we're going to apply, you know, the first, let's say this is the first layer, first layer. In the first layer, we're going to apply 32 filters, for example. And this is what it's going to look like if you apply one of those filters to the input image. And this is how the convolutional uh, confident output look like, right? So it seems that uh, whatever the filter was, you know, it is detecting these kind of edges and things like that here, right? So this is the first one. We can visualize the intermediate confident output. The second one, we can visualize the filters themselves. You can think of it as the features, right? So for example, here, as you can see, this is a very low level feature, low level feature. And low level feature, as you remember, we said that it's capturing some lines, right? You know, edges, lines, and things like that. And it seems that this filter, so again, remember, let's say we had you know, 32 of them at the very first layer. One of them is this, let me use another color. 32 of them, one of them is this, so this is one filter. And it's catching, let's say, some horizontal wavy lines like this, right? We can apply different of these filters to the input image. So this is how we visualize the filters themselves. And you can think of it as you know, features, visualizing features. And then finally, we can think about visualizing the heat maps, right? So there's this concept of CAM, you know, classic act class activation map. And basically it tells you that what part of an image let the model to classify this image to the right class, right? So for example, here, it seems that this part of the image, this part of the input image, it has the same size. This, this is a grid, 2D grid that has the same size as the input image. And it says that this part of the image was the, um, helping the model to figure out what was the class. The class was cat, the class was dog, the class was elephant, or etc. All right, now let's look into the details of these uh, visualizations. Okay, so starting with visualizing conv outputs. So what, what I want you to pay very good attention is that we are not visualizing the features. We are not visualizing the filters. We are visualizing the convolutional net outputs, right? Let's say at layer one, if I apply that filter, if I apply that eight filter, that 32 filter, that 64 filter, what is going to be, what, what's the, the, what does the that output look like, right? So this is what we're visualizing. And so let's say, for example, we go from, I don't know, layer one or blocks of layers to two, three, four, and five, right? So this is, we are going down deeper in the network, right? Usually you used to see it from left to right, but let's, let's say from going from uh, top to down, right? So we're going deeper, so deeper in the network, okay? And let's say that I have an input image. An input image is obviously a cat, and I'm going to apply a bunch of filters to that. So these are, let's say, filters. Filters. And let's say the filter is three by three, right? And remember, each filter is trying to capture something. So one filter is capturing a horizontal line, one feature, uh, filter is capturing vertical line, edges, and etc. right? Um, so then, it seems that the low level layers, so let's say layer number one, they act as collection of variance line and edge detectors. So remember, we're applying these edge detectors and then maybe, let me use another color, maybe red. So maybe this one is highlighting the edges, right? This one is doing something else. This one is doing something else, right? So focusing on these parts. So depending on how many filters we apply and what filters we apply, so it is capturing something. And we are visualizing those some things, right? We are visualizing, okay, after applying that filter, how the output uh, of the confident layer is going to look like. And this is going to look uh, how it looks like for layer number one. And as we go deeper in the network, so as we go from left to right, from top to down, as we go deeper in the network, and let's say we know that, first of all, the number of filters is going to increase. So here, let's say I applied, I don't know, just for the sake of argument, 8, and then 32, then 64, then 128, then 256. Imagine these are the number of filters, right? We know that as we go deeper in the, in the network, the size of the uh, input is going to shrink, 
and but then that's why we can afford applying more filters right but it seems that well what what happens is that the deeper presentations look at this one deeper presentations carry increasingly less information about the visual content right and more information related to class of the image so what does it mean just pay good attention you know as you go deeper it seems that the activations become increasingly more and more abstract and less visually interpretable right uh, so this means that as we go deeper in the network like this then uh, these these filters are, are going to begin to encode higher level concepts like cat ear or eyes as we go deeper down in other words we say that uh, you know for example in the first layers almost all of the filters are activated by the input right by the input image so for example because the first layer what are, what are the filters you know edges and, and that's as you can see all of the filters are kind of activated here right but as we go down as we go deeper in the network uh, in the following layers more and more filters are blank right so here at least you see look at that we have so many blank blanks here what does it mean it means that simply those filters that are supposed to be represented are not activated because here we are detecting eye we're detecting ear we're things like that right so and of course not in all part of the image is going to be active it's going to be activated it's not going to be observed right so hopefully this makes sense and uh, again i want you to do not confuse this one you know this kind of visualization with feature map visualization or with the filter visualization because that's something that uh, most of the time you will see compared to this one now let's look at the visualization of the filters okay how uh, this is the uh, the way that we are going to visualize the filters themselves and imagine again we have i don't know i'm showing you you know three layers you know it has let's say in the middle of the network layer two it's a block of layers right block four and block eight right and what you should pay attention is that it seems that the filters from the first layers encode simple directional edges and colors right so again um, let's say this is a well, block of layer two and as you can see what do we have we have horizontal wavy lines vertical lines things like that then as we go deeper in the network it seems that those filters are encoding some texture so now there is more texture to these ones right so hopefully you're seeing the textures right and these textures are made of a combination of those filters again as we go deeper in the network now we're going to see more textures that are similar to what we see in real images right so for example you can see a bunch of eyes here you know ears here and etc right and that's what i was uh, talking about in the previous network in the previous slide that as we go deeper in the network the filter is trying to detect or pay attention to um, high level features like this and that's why we get that the idea of a sparsity of activations uh, in the, the deeper in the networks right okay now the last one is basically visualizing heat maps or cam right so cam stands for a class activation map and the idea is very simple you know we just want to produce heat maps of class activations over inputs so basically cam is going to indicate how important each location right each pixel each location is with respect to the class under consideration so uh, obviously as you can see it has the same size so if, if this is i don't know i'm just making up numbers 256 by 256 then this is going to have 256 by 256 it's a 2d uh, yeah array right and then imagine the task is do you see african elephant african elephant in this picture right and uh, we are gonna map this heat map to the original input and this is how the output is going to look like right so it seems that here this part of the data was more important for the model to figure out that this is an african element african elephant right and basically so maybe the ears are more highlighted right so maybe the shape of the ears are more important 
or maybe I don't know something I'm not <laughs> I'm not an expert uh, but maybe this is what the model is capturing in terms of classifying that this is an African element okay so if you want to see if you want to follow the code so I highly encourage you to just um, look at this fantastic resource you know deep learning with Python by Francois Cholet so the the code is very straightforward you know but this is not not something that I cover in the in the Python uh, part of the course. Uh, in the Python part, I will, however, talk about transfer learning, which is the next topic. Okay, now let's talk about transfer learning. So here, we're going to start by reviewing some of the classical architectures. And just keep in mind that when I say architecture, and these are, let's say, the, the classical working architect architectures at the time, uh, you hopefully you will see that there's this common pattern you know that mhr for you no know, let's say formula modularity uh, hierarchy and reuse and um, so the pattern is pretty much the same and uh, the, pr the method that we're going to use some of them do batch normalization some of them do i don't know use separable convolutional layers or resnet depending on how we are going to combine these methods that we learned so far we come up with different architectures right so the point of this um, part, this is the last part of uh, this theory lecture, is that to make you familiar with the classical networks, architectures like, for example, LONET5, AlexNet, VGG16, and etc., and then leverage them and use them as a pre-trained model uh, to, to our, let's say, you want to customize your own model, so you're going to leverage information from that one and use the weights and apply to your own model, right? So we're going to talk about this concept, which is called transfer learning. All right, let's start with LoNet5. You know, this is probably one of the most classical uh, CNN architectures that it was developed by uh, Yann LeCun around 1998, right? So as I said, it was one of the first successful applications of deep learning when it comes to handwritten digit recognition, right? So this is in the, in the, in the, um, the Python part we talked about. Uh, using a simple neural network, it was very close to this LoNet5 for detecting, you know, handwritten digit numbers, right? And at the time, it was a breakthrough. It was a breakthrough in the field of computer vision. And um, now, of course, ex post, uh, the network seems very simple. But again, at the time, it, it, it was a big deal. So this architecture is very simple. It consists of a series of convolutional and pooling layer. Remember, do you see the patterns are repeating, right? So we have convent pooling to just extract features and reduce the size of the feature map. And then to, it's going to be followed up by a bunch of fully connected layers, right? So, and conf pooling, conf, oh, oops, sorry, conf pooling, conf pooling, and then a couple of fully connected layers, and then we have added the softmax. So uh, the filter size is five, stride one, and here the filter size is, well, it is not a filter size, this is a pooling, right? So we are going to shrink, we are going to downsampling it by literally half it, half the size, right? So we go from 32 by 32 to 28, 28, use six of those filters, then, then 14, 14, again, we are downsampling, again, applying filters, downsampling, you know, flattening, and then the, reducing the number of neurons and then passing it to the output layer. So here's just another representation of that. I just wanted you to be familiar with both notations because so far whatever I have done in this course is I show things like 28 by 28 by 6. There's another common term uh, notation that we can, you, you might see is, for example, 6 at 28, 28. Basically means that six of these filters and the size of the filter is 28 by 28. Okay, so hopefully you can see these things are pretty much the same. Okay, then uh, just remember this architecture has been very influ influential in uh, development of the successive models, right? Of course, we're not going to use them as the state-of-the-art <laughs> model as of today, but at the very least, it is still um, extensively used as a benchmark, right? So we can we can use LoNet5 as the benchmark for our uh, CNN and architecture that we are putting together. The next one is AlexNet, and the AlexNet, AlexNet was developed by Jeffrey Hinton and his team in, back in 2012. And uh, actually, it was one of the first CNN architectures that achieved very significant and successful uh, performance in image classification. LoNet was used for handwritten digit, digit classification, but this is um, the AlexNet did a huge improvement when it comes to image classification, right? 
and it basically it literally popularized CNN for this task of image classification and it was the first CNN to use ReLU activation function and which helps improve the training speed and accuracy of the model for sure. So we, we talked about all these things before the activation functions. Just remember that um, one of the properties of the AlexNet uh, architecture is that uh, it used very large filters, right? So they use a large number of filters in the convolutional layer. So for example, here when we are, oh, I don't know, down in the COM5 or COM4 layer, so we have 384, 256. So these are the number of the filters that we're using. So as you can see, there are so many filters and this will allow the model to learn more complex pattern, right? The size is a small 13 by 13, but we have so many filters. So it helps us to, uh, to learn more complex features from the input data. The next one is VGG16. VGG16 uh, was developed by Karen Simonian and Andrew Zisserman. Sorry if I butchered the name. Back in 2014, and um, at Visual Geometry Group. So this is where the name is coming from. VGG at Oxford University. So uh, the number of 16 refers to the fact that the network has 16 trainable layers. The layers that have actual weights, right? Trainable weights. And then the, its strength is its simplicity. The dimension is halved at each layer and the depth is increased on every step or stack of layers, right? So a uh, combination of deep architecture, simple design, and relatively small number of parameters, relatively, right? So we're gonna see those numbers, has contributed to the success of VG, VGG16 in computer vision, okay? So hopefully you're paying attention to this pyramid shape uh, of the VGG16. I'm going to show you a larger one in the next slide. But the idea is that it's a very it's a very simple design, right? We're uh, actually let me go to the next slide and uh, talk about it there. Okay. So here is the VGG16 in a larger scale. So we have an input image. Let's say the input is 224 by 224 by 3. You no, know, it's a great it's a colorful image. And then we have a combination of, so the pattern is conf, conf, pool, you know, conf, conf, pool, conf, conf, pool, right? So we have convolutional, convolutional pooling, convolutional, convolutional pooling, and et cetera, right? So the blue ones, these are convolutional, of course, we're going to apply the activation function ReLU here. And then the gray ones are max pooling. So these are the gray ones. And then we have fully connected layers at the end. And basically, we're going to do soft max for uh, image classification, right? So the, again, it's, as you can see, the, the shape is getting half at each point. And we are going to use, let me use an autocaller, more filter as we go down the network, okay? So the filters are doubled. So this, this is where the simplicity is coming from. And then we're gonna flatten things and then pass it uh, to the Apple layer. Okay, that was the VGG16. The next one is ResNet. This is actually one of the uh, more successful architectures which have been uh, used uh, pretty regularly in the literature. So it's a CNN architecture that was developed by a team at Microsoft back in 2015. Again, I don't want to butcher the name of the authors. So the, the key innovation of ResNet, as the name suggests, is the use of residual connections. So we already know in the best practice part of the course we talked about it, we already know what are residual connections. We said that we're going to use them as basically information shortcuts to make sure that we have a smooth information flow of information to, when we're doing forward propagation or backward propagation, right? So then... Uh, uh, this, this, the use of residual, residual connection is going to uh, help the model, allow the model to much, uh, to learn much, much deeper networks more effectively, right? Again, remember that game of telephone, right? We are introducing noise if the, if the, if the network is too deep. And the idea is that let's use some information shortcuts, all right? Let's add the input to this input. Let's add this to this output. Let's add this input, for example, to this output and et cetera, right? So by doing that, you now again we can uh, we make we can make sure that we can have a very very deep model and deep networks. ResNet has been used in, as a building block for so many other architectures, including Mask RCNN, UNet, and etc. So we're going to talk about some of them in the in the next video. 
Um, there are several variants of ResNet, and that depends on how many layers you're using, right? So if you use 50 layers, and then it's res we have ResNet 50, then ResNet 101 for 101 layers, ResNet 152 for 152 layers. Okay. Now, next, I want to compare the performance of all these models to ImageNet datasets and then see which one is performing better. Remember, each of these models were uh, kind of a breakthrough at the time they were developed, right? So the point is not run a horse race between these ones and the state of the art. So obviously the state of the art models are gonna win, right? But the point is that how we can, first of all, notice something common in all these models, and that's the modularity, you know, hierarchy, reuse, you know, that MHR formula, and different techniques that that's, it's shared among all of them. And we're going to leverage these ones to basically do transfer learning, right? So let's look at the performance of these ones um, applied to the same data set called ImageNet. Okay, let's compare the performance of these classical models using ImageNet data set. So for those of you who are not familiar with ImageNet data set, it's, it's a classical data set consists of more than 1 million images with 1,000 categories, right? And so as you can as you can imagine, there are almost anything you can think of there, you know, from vehicles to animals to mammals, you name it, you know, to, it's very broad, you know, it has 1000 categories. And the categories are then also organized into a hierarchy, which with each category having multiple subcategories, right? So this, this is a famous data set and it has played a significant role in the development of deep learning in general and of course has contributed a lot to the success of the state of the art models, right, in computer vision. So here are the models. We have the network name, no parameters, and top one accuracy. Top one accuracy, well, there, there, are, two, there are two metrics that we usually use uh, in computer vision is top one accuracy or top five accuracy. We also have top one error and top five error, you know, just equivalent to that. So top one accuracy simply basically says that what percentage of, percentage of the um, model is exactly accurately predicted, right? So imagine I have 100 images, right? And if out of 100 images, I'm classifying nine of them correctly, so top one accuracy is 95%. However, if within the same uh, data, and again, I'm, I'm predicting 95 of them correctly, but the rest of the five are among the top five most common classes, then the top five accuracy is 100%, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a difference between top one. And obviously top one accuracy is lower than top uh, five accuracy because top five accuracy is less conservative. So we are gonna, if we're gonna use top five for the data that has almost, I don't know, many categories like 1000. You don't apply top five uh, accuracy to a model, to the data set that has five classes, right? That, that, that's nonsense. Okay, so in terms of parameters, of course, Lonet is the most basic one because this is the oldest one, remember 1998. It only has 60,000 60, parameters compared to AlexNet, which is 60 million, VGG, which is 138, and ResNet 152, which has 60 million parameters. And uh, at the time, this used to be, you know, we considered a large model, but as of today, you know, by far, it's not a large model. Okay, then performance-wise, in terms of top one accuracy, for AlexNet, 63%, for VGG16, 74%, for ResNet152, 78.57%. And again, remember, at the time, these were breakthrough models, you know, uh, and they pushed the edge of this computer vision when it comes to cl image classification. If you want to see, you know, by the time that you're watching this recording, if you want to see where the state of the uh, art is, you no know, state of the art model. So here's a very good reference, you no know, papers with code. You know, you just go to image classification and there are different data sets there. For example, ImageNet, CIFAR, MNIST, you name it. All these famous data sets that we have competition on, right? And then you can see what is the, what is the latest one, for example. So for example, as of now, uh, here is the uh, latest state of the art models as of, uh, let's say, March 20, February 2023, right? So as you can see, you know, uh, again, we're looking at top one accuracy. You can play around with that. So again, here's the link. Just, I highly encourage you to look at the name of the newer models that basically all of, almost all of them are using a combination of transformers and convolutional layers. So it's a mix of two, which is playing a role in the yeah, state-of-the-art model, right? But uh, we can see here is our AlexNet, VGG16, ResNet 152, and then maybe, again, at, at, as of today, maybe this is the winner, you know, COCA. 
and uh, yeah these are uh, you can you can check out the documentation and see the, where the industry is headed at but as i said earlier most of these models here they are a combination of transformers and convolutional operate uh, convolutional layers all right so let's wrap up this uh, relatively long lecture video by going over the concept of transfer learning so transfer learning is a machine learning technique or deep learning whatever where a model trained on one task is reused on a second related task is repurposed right so we're going to we're going to fine-tune that model right on a second related task and the idea is that of course you know if you have let me use the right color so imagine the task is image classification right so the point is that no matter what image classification you're doing if you're classifying cat versus dog or i don't know classifying car versus you know different types of cars or bicycles and etc on the surface it seems that these are two different tasks right you know dog is very different than a bicycle yes at the very high level features they might be different but at the lower level features you know they all have edges they all have i don't know vertical horizontal lines and things like that so we can leverage those information right we don't need to reinvent the wheel from scratch we can say let's use a model let's use one of these very large models state-of-the-art models that have been trained out there you know sometimes it costs millions of dollars to train these models on very large data sets right so we don't need to retrain them again. We're going to use those weights and apply to our specific purpose, right? And the goal is that the reason that it works is simply image is image, right? So at the very low level, the features are pretty much the same. So let's let's use that. So we use this technique to leverage a model's backbone. So as I said, maybe the earlier layers by popping off its head so the head basically i mean the the, the last layer Let, let's cut the last layers right maybe last few layers and replace it with your own untrained layers that are appropriate for your task again this task can be cat versus dog the task that the model does maybe so here the predictions are you know cars bicycles and etc well cars and bicycles are very different let's say different types of cars right let's say toyota versus something else right and then here's cats versus dog so the idea is that yeah maybe on the surface they're different but here they're the same they're pretty much the same at the very uh, low level to features okay so transfer learning is useful because it helps you it allows the model to leverage the knowledge it has already gained from the first task and we're going to apply it to the second task potentially leading to improved performance on the second task and the idea is that we're going to save a ton of time right remember uh, let's say especially when you have small sample data set let's say for for whatever reason this question that you have in hand you know to, you, you have only 1000 observations or 2000 observations right and uh, in the lecture theory actually we're gonna we're gonna look into that example that when the sample size is small but we have, when we apply transfer learning it's gonna perform a lot better compared to a model without transfer learning right so the point is that uh, yeah you don't have the luxury to more data let's use a model that has been trained on ImageNet for example you know it's been trained on 1 million observations 1000 different classes whatever your classification is most probably is within that 1000 categories right and yeah that, that that's the idea there are two main ways of applying transfer learning the first one is feature extraction and the other one is fine-tuning so let's say this is your network right so this is a network of the I don't know a model like VGG 16 let's say this is VGG 16 model right and the feature extraction work like this the pre-trained model in this case VGG 16 is used to extract features and these features are then fed into your own model to your new model that is trained to perform the new task right so what does it mean it means that from this vgg16 i'm going to use these layers convolutional layers i'm going to cut the head right and then i'm going to say that okay let's let let me give you my image and you go ahead and make some predictions and give me the feature map right so these are the feature map feature these are very high level it can be high level or low level but, but most probably when we're doing the feature extraction you're looking at the high level features right feature map and then i'm going to apply these feature map to my own new let's say set of layers right i can i can add i don't know a couple of dense layers or i even can add my own convolutional layers you name it you can you can play around with it right and then i'm going to make my own classification 
So this is the concept of feature extraction. The second one, as the name suggests, is fine tuning. So let me go ahead and erase this one. The second one is fine tuning. So the fine tuning, the idea of fine tuning is we are going to unfreeze some of the layers of the pre-trained model. Not the, you know, we're not going to freeze all of them. So in feature extraction, we, we freeze all of them here. Here, we're going to freeze some of them. And actually, usually we are going to unfreeze the very last layer. So maybe this blocks of layer or this blocks of layers. And that's it. We don't freeze this, the first part of it. Because remember, remember guys, here at the very um, first early layers of the network, we are looking at low-level features. Low-level features. And the odds that low-level features in any task is pretty much the same is a lot higher compared to this one, right? So because here, if it is, I don't know, cat versus dog, we are detecting eyes and ears. But here, this is lines and edges, right? So we're not going to... We are not going to freeze these ones. We're going to uh, we are not going to unfreeze these ones. We're going to unfreeze these ones, right? Because we want to make sure that now let's say let's remove these eyes and ears. Maybe you're you're classifying different cars, right? There's no eyes, there's no ears. So you want to work with lower level features. So let's unfreeze these ones, add them to your model, and then retrain your the entire thing. So this is going to be the untrainable part. This is going to be the trainable part in the new model. Okay, that's pretty much it. So this was the concept of transfer learning. In the next video, I will walk you through to the Python part for transfer learning. Until the next one, take care.